Do you love your favorite cheat meal or dessert, but then the next morning you wake up feeling like gross and bloated? Well, I have found this new greens super powder that helps with that. And right now, Bloom is offering my listeners 15% off if you go to bloomnu.com slash holly. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. My guest today is a burlesque dancer and sex work activist who discovered she had a gift for sensual healing and is on a mission to use it to empower women of color. Let's welcome London Bridges. Hi, London. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. So um, let's start from the beginning. Tell us uh, your story and how you came to be where you are today. Yeah. So, um, I actually started off as a stripper. I was a stripper for about 10 years and I was working in New York majority of the time, but I, you know, traveled every now and then, but I realized that the strip club industry, especially for black women was definitely going down the toilet. Um, there was really, I like to say that the strip club couldn't afford me anymore. So, but I, I still loved doing the erotic entertainment that I was doing. So I started looking up, you know, strippers from the past and I knew nothing about burlesque. And then I started, you know, finding out Josephine Baker and um, all different types of erotic entertainers, Eartha Kitt being one of my favorites. And then I just said, okay, you know what? I'm going to jump into this. I don't know how, but I know I have something and I want to be a star. So I got straight into burlesque. So for those who may not be familiar, what's the difference between burlesque and stripping? And what was it about burlesque specifically that drew you away from stripping and attracted you towards that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's a lot, you know, it's a lot of it is the same because initially it's a strip tease, you know, you're taking off your clothes, you're creating an allure. But the difference that gravitated me to it was the performance style. It was like erotic Broadway for me. And you're acting and you're the elaborate clothes and you become more of a creative, you know, in the strip club, you, you cook do something with your clothes and make it into something new for the most part. But, you know, in burlesque, you are able to add the diamonds and, you know, it's just elaborate. And I really loved it. And me being somebody who liked to put on a show and liked to put on a solo show, that is another thing that really gravitated me to it was the fact that I was able to be the main star on the stage. And also the fact that the, the burlesque community is ran by women. And that was just so empowering to me. It was not diluted or overly sexualized or stigmatized like the sec like the strip club industry is. Um, when women are in control of a lot of things, it seems to have a bit more, I don't want to say the word, but I'm going to say it, class to it. Um, not to say that strippers, we not classy, but <laughs> we're deaf, like, it's just a different um, way that people look at us. Yeah. There's a lot more theatrics, it seems to burlesque and a lot more time and effort put into the costumes and the props. And, um, it just seems a lot more, uh, like kind of staged and intentional. I love burlesque. It's so fun. Um, I've seen Dita Von Teese's New Year's Eve show and there's a, a show before the pandemic, of course, that was playing here in Los Angeles all the time. Um, run by Donna Hood, and the name is escaping me right now. I Tease don't know if you why. please. Tease if you please. Thank you, yeah. which was so cool. And the cool thing about that was 
there was a lot of fun to it. You know, it wasn't like, it was of course girls, you know, taking off their clothes and getting naked, but there was like, there was this one girl, I don't know her name, but she did a dance where she started off in like a Godzilla dinosaur costume. It was hilarious. It was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life, but it was also sexy. Like the fact that she could mix those two was so interesting. And then they have contortionists on and there was just, it was just really inventive. And you could tell these people put a lot of time and effort into their shows. And it was just, um, and, and you're right because it's, it's, I know you use the word classy, which you didn't want to use. And I understand, you know, your hesitation there, but it does feel like you could take your mom to a burlesque show, but maybe not to a strip show. Exactly. It's just, it's, you know what it is? People, you know, not, not everybody who gets into the strip club industry do it because they have to, some do it because they want to. But when it comes to burlesque, like basically everyone that gets into it is because they want to and they love taking their clothes off and they want to figure out new ways to take off their clothes. Do you think it's because like the, the level of entry is kind of set higher because burlesque is difficult to do, you know, like there's a lot of, like we just said, like staging and planning and all that kind of stuff. You can't just kind of run in off the street and like, just do a burlesque show. Like you have to have something you have to have a theme or something like that. Whereas I know in strip clubs, you know, they'll have like open amateur night where girls literally walk in off the street and just like do a dance. Mm -hmm. I, I really think that has a big part of it, but I'm going to be honest. It's the way that the men really portray and honestly, try to have a control over women in the industry, um, in the strip, strip club industry. And yeah, the coming in, the payment, you know, is, is a lot. It's not as much, you know, I'm talking about ticket sales or even admissions to into the club. Um, it's just the objective, objecting women. That's really the goal in the strip club is to objectify women and to make money off of women. Whereas in the burlesque industry, we're women who love doing what we're doing and we make money doing it as well. And you think, like burlesque is more like celebrating women. Than- it definitely is. And also it's huge on body positivity, mm. huge on it. Whereas, you know, where I'm coming from in the strip club, you know, especially in New York, where it's very racist in New York and it's very, um, you know, you have to have your body done. You have to do certain things to your body to make money when that's not even the case. And whereas when you go to burlesque, it's (laughs) let it all hang out as long as you're confident doing it. Yeah, that's absolutely true. There was some definitely like, um, bigger women in the burlesque shows that we watched and they were fantastic and fabulous and loved their body and proud of it. And everybody was just going crazy over them. Um, so tell us a little bit more about your early experience in the strip club. Um, what, what got you into doing that? And then what were, were there any specific experiences that would illustrate, you know, how you were telling me that it's, it's racist and it's, um, you know, objectifies women. Do you have like any specific stories around that? Oh, where do I even start? (laughs) (laughs) Where do I even start? Um, so typically, um, if you see my pictures, I have an Afro, um, Mm -hmm. these locks are faux, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but, um, I have an Afro and I would go to clubs and audition the clubs and they would tell me that, I have to do my hair. I can't work in their club, you know, with my hair being natural or just just being a black girl in New York working at clubs. There would be even an opportunity for me to work at a club and I would go and they wouldn't hire me because they literally would say we have enough black girls. Wow. And it's just another instant (laughs) is, um, I, I'm a really good entertainer. I I love tooting my horn. I'm, I'm not humble when it comes to it. I'm really good at what I do. 
And I was waiting for my stage time. I loved being on stage. I was not one of those girls who hated being on stage. I loved my stage time. And I was at work for about five hours and I did not get a stage time. And the only girls that got the stage time were uh, the Hispanic girls, the white girls. But when it came to me, you know, my name in the club was Chastity. Chastity did not get a stage set. And it was very hurtful because I'm like, I deserve time, you know? And it got to a point where after I just decided to uh, transfer out of the club, one time I came back and I was gone for a while and the club owner, I was actually doing really good because I was gone for a very long time. And the club owner pulled me aside at like the end of the night, it was 4 a.m., and pulled my application out and slammed it on the table and was like, you're not supposed to be here. And on my application, it said fired and for being drunk. And I was said, that's a lie. I don't even drink. Anybody in the club, my customers, the other dancers could tell you that I don't drink. And at the time, I especially wasn't drinking because I was pregnant. So... Mm-hmm. It's you couldn't tell me that I was belligerently drunk to the point where you fired me. And then he just started stuttering and was like, well, anyway, look at you. You look like a cow. Get out of my club. You're not supposed to come back here unless you lose 70 pounds. And at that moment, I was just like, oh. And I looked around. I said, oh, wow, all the black girls are gone. And I was working at that club for a pretty long time because I was club hopping, trying to find a decent paying club. And at that time, I was just like, you know what? It's time to move to Atlanta and just start this journey on burlesque. And so what was your first introduction to burlesque? Like, how did you come into that world? And what was your first impression of it? My first introduction, I... I'm trying to think. Okay. So my first introduction, I went to my coach, Naomi Vusey. And at the time she was not my coach, but I saw her doing burlesque and on, she ended up on my social media somehow. And I'm like, that's what I want to do. And that's how I want to do it. So when I was ready, I finally reached out to her and she had me dance for her. And then a couple weeks later, she threw me in a show. I didn't even know what I was doing. I've never performed like that before. She just said, all right, this is the choreo, maybe two days beforehand. She said, this is the choreo. We learned the choreo. She told me how I'm supposed to dress. I showed out and I was in there. And the moment it was a kink party, I was doing burlesque at a kink party for Casey Carter. And it changed my life. I was just like this this is beautiful. And the way that she pushed me out, she pushed me like I was already the star of the show. And then ever since then, whenever I would do performances, um, I would be like kind of the main act until I was going to be headlined. And then COVID happened and shut everything down. But honestly, How I got in, I just really bet on myself and believed in myself and really knew that this is what I want to do. And I knew I had something. And clearly my coach, she saw I had something because she saw me dance one time and threw me in in a show with her. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. So when did you discover that there was like some healing that could be had from this? Ooh, I found out there was healing in it when I was working with my coach. Um, she was very sensual. She was also an ex stripper. So she taught me that my sensuality is healing. And it's crazy. I started to look back at when I was stripping and all the things that I was going through. And I immediately started to feel better when I was on stage. Uh, The sensual movement. I started learning about chakras and learning about my sacral chakra and how, you know, moving that womb energy is a superpower. 
and what it can do and how it could move traumas if you really focus and utilize that energy. So when she started teaching me that and I started seeing how she was healing herself with that energy, I just started, anytime I was going through anything, I'll just put on some music clear out the floor and just start moving because I started becoming very in tune with myself and listening to my body more and trusting and learning my body more. Mm. Yeah. So it seems to me that maybe it came to you where you started off doing the dancing. It was kind of like a a career choice. It was, you know, you were making money from it, but then you started to see that it could actually fulfill you in like a spiritual way as well. Yes. Yes. Definitely. Um, Like I said, that sacral chakra energy, that moving, that yoni energy, it's, it's a powerful source. And once you learn how to control it, there's so much that you could do with it. Could you explain to people who've maybe never taken a yoga or a meditation class, like what a chakra means, what like yoni energy means? Yeah. So yoni is the Sanskrit still learning these words, (laughs) the Sanskrit word for vagina. Um, So when I'm talking about a yoni, I'm talking about your vagina. Now, um, your, your chakras, I'm still learning how to explain exactly what a chakra is, but your chakras, they rule certain parts of your body. So let's say for instance, my sacral chakra, um, that's all about womb, uh, vagina energy, yoni energy. Um, Even if, for instance, we could go up to my uh, solar plexus, because I'm really into inner child work. Your inner child, your inner child work is ruled by your solar plexus. And then, you know, obviously your stomach is there too, and the different organs within your stomach. Um, When you're out of alignment, certain things may happen. So if you're out of alignment and For instance, right now I'm using my voice, my throat chakra. If I am not utilizing my throat chakra, I may be coughing or something may happen within my throat where I have to utilize it. I'm a singer, so sometimes I may have to sing and I haven't been singing or I may have to come on a show and speak and, you know, tell my experiences to somebody. Something is out of alignment where I have to do something to put myself into alignment. Mm -hmm. I'm going to cheat really quickly because I've taken like lots of yoga and meditation classes and I've been, you know, taught about like, you know, centering your chakras. So it's a word that I've had in my vernacular for a long time. But then I thought to myself, if I had to describe it, like I also like wouldn't know the exact definition. So I'm just going to like cheat really quickly and read from WebMD, which is so interesting that it's on here. Um, It says some spiritual views hold that our body is more than physical and mental. It's also an energetic system called chakras. Chakra is Sanskrit word that means wheel or cycle. There are seven main chakras situated along the spine from the base of your spine to the crown of your head. They are thought to provide subtle energy that helps your organs, mind, and intellect work at their best level. Um, And then they, there's a whole, they explain each chakra and then they talk about the sacral chakra um, considered to be responsible for sexuality, creativity, intuitiveness, self-worth, compassion, and adaptability. When the sacral chakra is unstable, it is thought to cause emotional outbursts, lack of creativity, and sex obsessed thoughts. That's kind of interesting, right? Where like you're the chakra that's supposed to be connected to your sensuality. If it's out of balance, it creates sex obsessed thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so, so th- you're healing yourself through, through movement. Um, you're working with your coach and then you, you then come to discover that you also have a gift to help teach this healing to other people. So how did you, how did you come to that conclusion and how did you start to help other people heal themselves through movement as well? Yeah. So again, my coach, shout out to my coach. Um, she told me, she was like, teach a class, teach a dance class. And I never thought of it because honestly, being a stripper, because of the stigma that comes behind it, I never thought, and also not even just the stigma of coming behind being a stripper. I never was like a pole dancer. Mm -hmm. I was just, I was a low flow floor entertainer. So Mm -hmm. I never really thought I had much to teach people. 
And then so she introduced me to a, a gym, a, uh, a dance gym. And so that I could start teaching there. And on Valentine's Day, I think it was 2017 or 18, uh, I had my first class. And it was just so beautiful. The women that took my class and how much they loved it. Because in a lot of these pole dancing class gyms, they don't teach the sensuality side of things. And a lot of these gyms, they are owned, some of them are owned by strippers, but a lot of them are owned by people who took a class, they perfected the craft, and then they opened up their own pole gym. And they miss the seductive side of things and the sensuality side of things. And the person who owned the gym was so focused on choreography and me... I'm not too much into choreography. I mean, I learn it. I'm I'm good at picking it up if I have to, but I'm still trying to learn what an eight count is. I am all about the energy. <laughs> I love the energy that you could feel when you hear music. And I love teaching women how to forget an eight count. Don't think about an eight count because I'm going to tell you right now, before I was a stripper or when I was learning how to be a stripper, I tried to do a dance for one of my exes and he laughed at me in my face because I was so focused on trying to figure out how to do an eight count, how trying to remember the steps. And I forgot about the sexy side of what I was doing, the sensual side of it. So even just tapping into women and helping them speak to their womb, helping them open up their sensual side and be comfortable with that side. Because let's be real, society really tries so hard for to have us women not know about ourselves sensually and sexually. And once we begun, begin to gain confidence within ourselves and within our yoni power, people start to shun us and shame us and call us all types of names. And in a class with me, it's a safe space. Listen, be as sexy as you want. Open your legs as far as you want. If you open your legs and some lips come out, it's okay. It's okay. (laughs) Embrace your lips. (laughs) Embrace (laughs) them. Enjoy them. And learn how to, what to do with them. Learn how to pop your vagina. (laughs) (laughs) god it's so true yeah i mean there's you know there's been you know centuries and centuries of of the attempt to suppress the power of female sexuality because it is very powerful and i can also very much relate to you know um you really trying to tap into the sensuality of the dance rather than the eight count or the specifics, because I feel that I would be intimidated to take a class such as yours because I would be afraid that I couldn't remember the choreography because I would be afraid that I couldn't follow the eight count. Um, But I think going with the idea of that, it's really just about tapping into the movement that helps free your yourself. Um, sexually, spiritually, um, that feels something much more attainable than being able to like remember a dance sequence. Cause I'm not very good at that. I don't think any of us really are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any of us really are. And I just feel like if you just tap into yourself, even if you're learning how to dance or learning how to flow, that's what I like to call it for a partner it's very important to learn how to do it for yourself first. Mm-hmm. You know, if you lo- if you know how to arouse yourself and know the things that you love and desire, then you'll be able to arouse and have a, an, a, a partner arouse you as well. But be that partner for yourself. Arouse yourself. If you're in the mirror dancing, touch the parts of your body that you enjoy being touched. You know, seduce yourself 1,000%. Mm, I love that. I love that. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk more about the power of sensuality through movement and so much more. So hang tight. We'll be right back. 
I am a big dessert lover. I absolutely have to have my sugar fix at night. And especially if I go out to dinner, there's no way I'm not ordering dessert, but then I feel really gross the next morning. So that's why I'm so excited about Bloom. It really helps me with my digestion and my bloating issues so that I can wake up the next morning feeling great. Bloom Greens are packed with over 50 nutrients, including whole fruits and veggies, fiber, probiotics, antioxidants, and more, all in one easy to drink formula. Mix it in with water or a smoothie to add to your daily routine. And right now, Bloom is offering my listeners 15% off if you go to bloomnu.com slash holly. That's B-L-O-O-M-N-U dot com slash holly to get 15% off your order. Take charge of your mornings and get into that daily routine that's going to make you feel your best with Bloom Nutrition. All right, guys, we're back. Uh, so Lyndon, you've mentioned before that you're a sex trafficking survivor um, and that being um, a erotic entertainer and pro-submissive helped you heal from that. Can you tell us a little bit more about that experience? Yes. So. Um where should I start? <laughs> let's start, let's start with the first part. Let's start, uh, let's start with your sex trafficking, um, story. Yes. Yeah, so, um, it was a couple years ago. I, again, I was in the strip club trying to figure out what I wanted to do ne- in the next phase of my life. I had just got out of a very toxic relationship and, I just kept having toxic relationships. So I said, you know what? Let me focus on myself and learn something. I wanted to believe in something. I didn't believe in anything. And I feel like that was the um, the recipe of disaster for me in, in my life at the time. So um, I came to Atlanta to visit my mother. And I started just looking up stuff. My cousin introduced me to a documentary called Hidden Colors. I believe that's Hidden Colors. Yes. Um, And it was just a culture, a culture shock. It was just so much about Black people. And I'm somebody who is from the suburbs. I am from Long Island. And I grew up in a white neighborhood. You know, we, Black people, history is not a thing in my neighborhood. Honestly, Black history is not a thing in any neighborhood for the most part, but especially in my neighborhood. And I just really wanted to learn what it was to be Black, a Black woman. I wanted to be more in touch with my culture. And um, I finally saw the documentary and I was just very upset. I was so upset. I was like, what do you mean we were kings and queens? What do you mean we were gods and goddesses? All I know was that I was a slave and nothing more. So then I came back to New York because I I fell in love with Atlanta. I really did. I fell in love with the energy. And I said, you know what? I'm going to make my my money and I'm going to come back. Within that time, I met up with this girl that I was working with in the club, but she disappeared for a while, but then she came back and I was telling her all the things I learned. (laughs) I'm black. I'm proud. (laughs) I got all this knowledge on being black, but I'm 25. I really know nothing. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm 25 and I'm like three months into this knowledge. I'm like, I don't know shit. And first thing she was like, you sound racist. And she's a black woman, you know, she's black. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, all right, whatever. And then I started saying, like, you know, I just I want to learn something about spirituality. I just don't know where to start. You know, I don't know who to go to. I just, do I get books, anything? She's like, I know a guy. I was like, all right, cool. Put me on. And she did. And I met him. And it's so funny because he had a accent. It's like he made himself have, like, a Spanish accent. Um, When I first saw him, he had his head down and I let him in. And the moment I let him in, I, my intuition, but being a woman and being a black woman, our intuition is crazy. It's not real. We don't have one. Mm -hmm. Um, So I didn't trust my intuition. I did not trust my gut. Um, He was supposed to be giving me a quote unquote reading. 
And immediately the um, the sex slavery happened. I immediately became his sex slave. The rape started happening. And at that moment, I was in too deep and I didn't know how to get out. Um, this was something that it was based off of me finding spirituality. But this was a man who was, I believe, was addicted to sex workers, was addicted to sex workers of color. And because of the stigma behind sex workers that we don't have anybody, we don't have no family to care about us, he attacked in a way that he thought was going to tear me apart, which Mm -hmm. it did for the most part, but I came, I came back. And, um, yeah, so that happened and I was, I was his sex slave for two years. He gave me permission to come to New York. I mean, come to Atlanta because I initially was going to come back, but I ended up being home for a year. I don't know what happened. I was just there for a year. And he gave me permission to come back because my mom was really going through some things. He, She was dying. And he gave me permission to come back. And after maybe a year of being here, uh, I decided not to go back because I felt like I was not going to survive if I went back to him. Because I was coming back and forth to New York and to Atlanta, back and forth for every three months, because that's that's what I had to do. And one day I was going to hop on a flight and something in my spirit, it was God, my grandmother, everybody was just like, don't go. Listen to yourself this time. Please trust yourself. So when you say that he, you became his sex slave, what do you mean like specifically to him or did he like farm you out to other people? Like, so to him. So, um, I didn't know what I was. Mm -hmm. It was a therapy session with Jasmine Mm -hmm. that she was like, you're his, you were his sex slave. That was sex slavery because Mm -hmm. I really just wanted to figure out like what the fuck was going on in my life. And I'm sorry, am I allowed to curse? (laughs) Yes, yes. Okay. I just wanted to know like what was going on in my life and I didn't know. But yeah, I was his sex slave. I was not allowed to touch myself. I was not allowed to hug anybody. I wasn't allowed to have sex with anybody. I was not allowed to have any physical contact with any other human but him. And Mm -hmm. if I was, it was only because I was supposed to go and go to work. He said, Mm -hmm. you got to go to work. You got to make money. All right. You're allowed to go strip, but that's all you're allowed to do. Other than that, you got to make sure after you strip, you come see me in a couple of days so that Mm -hmm. we could do, quote unquote, some type of cleansing or whatever. Did he like also control other aspects of your life? Did he like control your finances and like who your friends were and your personal life? Not my finances. Um because he was portraying this as a as a reading um I did have to give him money every time I like saw him like every 21 days I had to mm-hmm. give him you know money for the reading um but my friends there were a lot of people that I was not allowed to hang out with um the mm-hmm. young lady that trafficked me to him she mm-hmm. fell off the face of the earth we were not allowed to speak to each other at all um and a lot of my friends, I was not allowed to speak to, but because I, you know, I'm I'm a little stubborn, I'll say it. My best friends that he was telling me not to talk to, I would just tell him like, yeah, I'm not talking to them. And then, you know, check on them every like few months. So when you say that you like, he would have you come do like a cleansing. So was he, was he ensnaring you with this idea of like, this is like, I'm your spirit. It almost sounds like he was like, kind of captive he had you captive in like a spiritual way as well does that sound yeah. right it's 100 percent right it was 1000 percent um spirituality so he portrayed himself as my godfather um and you know in some sp- spiritual communities a godfather i would like to say is like a teacher um mm-hmm. to guide you through your spiritual path um 
Whereas he was not doing that. He was just telling me what to do and what not to do, telling me to uh, rely on Jesus and Jesus is king and all that stuff. And it's just after a while, especially honestly, being in Atlanta is really what helped um, because I started, you know, dating because I'm like, all right, yeah, you know, I'm free. I'm about to, you know, be in Atlanta is where I want it to be. But I'm still like, I still had this thing back home, but I felt like drained. I just didn't understand. I said, I'm happy. I started a podcast. I'm starting to do burlesque. Things feel good, but there's something that's still draining me. And he would say that, oh, it's the people you're hanging out with. Stop doing the podcast. Stop doing this. Stop doing that. And it's like, I felt like I was being sabotaged. Mm. I felt like everything about me was being sabotaged. And it just didn't feel right. And then the anger really came about was when I finally decided to have sex with somebody else. And he lost his mind. He yeah. it, it, he went into a huge jealous rage. And I was just like, and I had to fly back to New York immediately. And it was just a big thing, but I just couldn't stay away from that person because I built such a trauma bond with him. It mm-hmm. just didn't feel right. I'm like, this is not, I don't know anything about spirituality. I don't know shit about it. This doesn't feel like this is, it's like when you're in a relationship, when you're in a marriage that's broken and it's like, love, this is not what love feels like. I'm like, this is not what guidance feels like. It Mm -hmm. feels like I'm being controlled. It feels like, it felt like I was a slave. Mm -hmm. And then, so then you left him, I assume. And then is that when you started to discover like that you could find that spiritual healing that it sounds like you were looking for through burlesque? Yeah. So honestly, I found the spiritual, the spiritual healing, um, within myself because I stopped burlesque. Okay. I completely stopped, you know, the world shut down. So I actually had the time to heal because I was going full throttle with burlesque and enter in performances. I still had that stripper mentality of do what you got to do, work through the pain, get this money. Mm -hmm. And when I decided to stop, you know, performing, I mean, the world decided for me, Um, (laughs) but (laughs) it was the little things that I started finding that I was doing in burlesque that I loved. I was playing dress up. I was creating characters. Um, A lot of my characters are, you know, I have some in the kink community. I'm called Lady London. You know, I'm a lady. You know, I dress like a lady. I dress in my, you know, my stepper white dresses. And, you know, I'm a lady and I'm having a fun time and I'm having a tea party. And I realized I'm doing things like a little would do. And I'm Mm -hmm. putting them in my performances. And I started having tea parties, you know, with my friends. And after that, I just, I, Jasmine invited me to be a submissive for her. And after that, you know, I've gotten flogged every now and then, you know, I've gotten spanked, but to be an actual bottom for a substantial amount of time and to be put into a subspace because I was on cloud (laughs) 1000. I was there. I was like, oh, okay, let me start looking into what this is and why I love it. So then I started learning about age regression and, you know, um, little space and subspace and all the things that I'm doing that are naturally healing for me. So I, Honestly, I didn't even move my body anymore, which is typically something that I do. I move, I stretch, but I, I, my physically, I felt so paralyzed that the only thing I can do was cater to my mentality, my mental health and my spiritual health. And the only way I was able to do that was to have tea parties and not just with my friends, but, you know, setting up an altar and speaking with my ancestors and having tea with them and speaking about my day and, you know, reflecting and, you know, 
doing the shadow work on myself. And for those who don't know what shadow work is, looking at your darkest side of yourself and holding parts of yourself accountable, but also healing it, not just pushing it to the back of your mind or pushing it for another day to deal with it, deal with it right now. And at that moment, I said, oh, I have something. And then I started, you know, I created an afternoon tease party where we play house, you know, we play dress up, we have tea parties, we color, we do any type of arts and craft, and we write down intentions. And then we also write down the things that we want to release. And with that energy, we move and we do um, any type of sensual movement to help move that energy to release any trauma because that is initially what I did to help heal myself is to put myself in a little space, but also embrace my sensual space and my subspace at the same time. So you've mentioned the word little space uh, a few times. Is that like an age regression thing? Yes. Um, so okay. when I go into little space, I'm age regressing, to, age regressing to around the ages of four and seven. Okay. And do you feel like that, that do you feel like, that works for you because that was like a safe time in your life or is it the opposite and you want to reclaim and re-experience that the way that you should have at that age? Does that question make sense? Yeah, it makes complete sense. And it's actually a safe space in my time. I've never experienced sexual trauma or any type of trauma, you know, mm -hmm. between the ages of four and seven. And I could really say eight years old, but it's really a age of four and seven. And that is the safest time for me. That's the only time I know like the truest form of happiness for me. And you said that you were able to reach that through uh, being submissive, right? Yes. I was able to, honestly, when I do like, cause I am a non-sexual um, little but my mm -hmm. other identities as a submissive is a kitten and princess, you know? So, but when I realized that I was a little, it was the type of performances that I would do and the type mm -hmm. of things that I would do. Like, I love playing dress up. That is one of my favorite things. Alice in Wonderland is my favorite Disney movie. And I love recreating a performance that is based around Disney movies and or any type of cartoon that's my favorite. I love creating those type of performances. And it's so funny when I actually am in a performance space, um, a lot of my co-stars, I like to call them co-stars, with me, they realize that I turned into something different. You know, my voice becomes smaller and you become very adorable. And I'm just like, yeah, because... I'm happy right now. I'm in, I'm in my little space, you know, I'm not fully there, but I'm kind of peeking at it. <laughs> it's interesting. Cause it makes me think about, I, you know, I, I had a great childhood and I, um, I, I, so often, especially now that I have a toddler, I think back upon like the magic that we saw the world in, you know, and how just we, the world was so different and your imagination was really all you needed and just everything was, was extra sparkly and how amazing it would be to capture that feeling again. And I had an issue with, um, alcohol for a long time. I've been sober for a few years now. And I, and I, I think about it a lot and I think about, it, I wonder if part of actually, in fact, I really do think that part of my, you know, desire to drink so much was trying to capture that magic back you know, that I had in childhood. So you talking about this makes, makes sense to me. Do you think that, that discovering it through submissive work was because, because I also like when I, if I gauge in any BDSM play, I'm also a submissive. Um, is that just having all of those layers of like control and adulting stripped away from you? You know, all those things that we have to do when we're grown up and having somebody else in control, it kind of gave you that freedom to, find that space again, where you kind of were in the same situation, just in terms of not having responsibilities and not having to make decisions and stuff like that. That's exactly what it is to be able to safely give control to somebody. Like mm -hmm. I'm literally saying, I don't want to do anything. I don't mm -hmm. want to think for myself. 
I don't want to feed myself. I don't want to do anything. I just want to exist in my mm-hmm. femininity some way, somehow just allow me to exist and spoil me the way I see fit. And it's, again, it's that feeling safe enough to do that. You know, when I had my first um, pro sub experience and honestly, my first like real sub experience with Jasmine and King, everything made sense. (laughs) Everything made sense. The communication, the setting the boundaries, the setting the intentions, the making sure that the paddles or the flogs are good, like, okay, how does this feel? Does it feel good? Oh, you don't like that? Okay, we're not even going to touch that when it comes to you. Mm-hmm. you. You, They did not go past. I didn't even have to say a safe word or do a safe movement. And I, I do put my hand up and do a safe movement because the music was very loud. So she's like, we're not going to be able to hear you. So put your hands up. So if, if anything, they never went past my pain threshold. I felt, and man, I was up there for 90 minutes <laughs> with heels on, standing up, getting flogged. And I was in such a safe space that the pain from my ankles didn't even feel like anything. It wasn't mm-hmm. until afterwards we were done. It was like, oh, oh, I was standing. <laughs> I was standing <laughs> in heels for a minute. Yeah. And it's just that, I allowed them to have full control over my body. And I haven't done that with anybody, especially after my um, my trauma. To allow somebody to take over like that, I didn't have that kind of trust. And it felt good to know that there are people out there that I can trust and that there are more people out there that I can trust if we allow ourselves to have that communication, set those boundaries, talk about triggers, talk about traumas that may trigger you in this field. Because for me, there's a lot of things in here that mimic a lot of things that I went through. And Mm -hmm. if I'm able to speak about those things to somebody before it becomes a thing, or if it does become a thing, they know exactly how to handle me without blaming me or just throwing me away and saying she's just too hard to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've mentioned um, that you want to surround yourself um, with other divine women. What can you explain to us? What is about a, what about a woman makes them divine? I feel like a woman who is divine is a woman who honors herself and trusts herself and takes care of herself and knows the path that she's on and can see clearly. A woman like that who treats themselves with that amount of respect will treat other women with that much respect, other people with that much respect. The more you nurture yourself as a woman is the more you'll nurture other people. You could show up for other people. And also, I'm going to be honest, like, high value women, women like that is just the blessings that come to you when you when you're not trying to control things and control everything that surrounds you and you're just allowing things to flow to you. I like being around women like that. I like being around women that are not catty and, you know, understand that, oh, the things I'm saying are hurting the people around me. Let me hold myself accountable and say, what triggered me to be this person this day? You know, because you're not, we're not going to be perfect every day. That's just not a thing. You know, we, we can be catty bitches sometimes if, <laughs> if somebody hits us on the wrong day. And it's mm-hmm. like, I'm a type of person, if I'm really going through some things, because I know I could project and I could change a room with my energy alone. I don't go anywhere. If I'm going through some things, I'm not going anywhere. Don't hug me. I'll even tell people, listen, I'm here because I have to, but don't hug me. Don't touch me. I don't want to put this energy onto you because I was crying Mm. or I was going through, I was arguing with somebody or whatever it may be. I don't want to project that on you. That to me Mm -hmm. is a divine woman. Mm. Yeah. And that takes a lot of power to do that, to, to not 
project your your anxiety and your the black cloud onto other people. And yeah, I totally understand. I totally relate. It's hard. Uh, yeah, it is. It is. Um, what is the siren effect? Oh, the siren effect. <laughs> That's my baby. <laughs> I just glit- glowed up. So the siren <laughs> effect, um, it is a business that I created on my birthday. It's my baby. <laughs> I created her on in 2018. And it is a safe space for women. Um, I definitely gear towards women of color because we're not taken care of. We're not protected. And there's a lot going on with us women in our lives right now. And I really want us to have a safe space to open up and learn how to be sensual and seductive and be free and speak about your 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 traumas openly and freely. So I created the Siren Effect so that women could have spaces to either get a reading safely without people always saying that we're going to initiate you and no. <laughs> Listen, I'm here to give you guidance. Whatever it is that you need, I'm here to guide you. I'm here to protect you. I'm here to listen to you. If you may need therapy, I have a I have therapists that I trust that I could send you to if you need Reiki, anything like that. So also we create, we have afternoon teas parties that I mentioned before, um, which is my little space parties. With, pe- with women who are not even littles, but I think we all have a tiny bit of little in us where we just want to be that little girl. Um, so it's definitely a space for women of color and all women. I, and I, you know, accept all women to enjoy. And it's an umbrella operation for me. So I always call my business an enterprise because it's an enterprise. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so it's an umbrella operation. And under that, we have the House of Sirens, which is an alliance for sex workers, where if you need a place to work, if you want to learn how to elevate your craft, if you want to learn how to elevate your brand, whatever it may be, because me being somebody who only came from the strip club, I didn't know anything I was doing when I came into this and no one wanted to teach me. When it felt like people were going to teach me, they just left. And I want to be able to help people you know, help sex workers get off the street. If they want to continue doing the work that they're doing, you can, and you can definitely be a businesswoman or man in this field. Um, And again, guiding them to any spiritual health or spiritual wellness um, practitioners or practices and, you know, school, you know, we can further our education as sex workers. Tantra is a thing. Sexology is a thing. We need more sex workers, even therapists to be in this field. And don't think that just because you're a sex worker, that there's not room for you. This is a whole entire world and industry that has a high demand. And so with the Siren Effect and the House of Sirens, I, they're sister brands and I just really want them to help empower women. I love it. As an activist, what is the number one thing that you want people to know about sex work or what are some of the biggest misconceptions that you see that you hope to dispel? I want people to understand that sex workers are human, that we're not just people and I say people because I was going to say women, but there's men and women in this field, um, that we're not just people that don't have anything going for ourselves, that we're not all just a bunch of addicts that don't have a family. And, you know, we're people, we're human, and we have human experiences. And if people see us as that, I feel like we would get the respect that we deserve, that we will, you know, finally allow us to decriminalize sex work Um, because I'm not somebody who's just on the streets. You're not somebody who's just on the streets. You know, we are people who are make are 
working very hard to make an honest living. And I say honest very strongly because we're living our honest truths. And it's very important for people to know that there's a lot of us out there that really choose this work. Even if we did get into this work, you know, because we had to, we end up staying because this is something that we love. This is something that we utilize to not just heal ourselves, but to heal our customers that come to us. We're providers, we're practitioners. So the moment people see us as humans and as providers and practitioners, I feel like the more respect that we'll have and the more people will fight with us and for us. Yeah. And it's been an interesting thing to see too, because, you know, you you mentioned that, you know, we're not just uh, people on the streets, you know, sex workers are not just people from the streets. And if one was to measure something being an honest job, right. As to like a level of say like entrepreneurship or financial success, we've seen this insane elevation of so many women and so many sex workers through the pandemic via like the success of all these personal content platforms and premium social media platforms. We're like, sex workers are doing extraordinarily well right now compared to in the past. And I know so many women that have started other businesses that um, are dabbling in real estate that are really like, I mean, they're real businesswomen. And it's just been a really exciting thing to see and see sex workers, sex workers take like a real charge of their, of their careers and their futures and, you know, become activists and advocates like you. So it's just, uh, uh, thank you for being a, a, a wonderful example of, you know, how far women have come in this industry and how much more further we can go. Thank you so much. I just think it's very important that, you know, we keep the love, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of love in this, in this industry. And the moment, you know, we continue to love one another, I feel like we could have, you know, such a beautiful, I mean, this is such a beautiful industry, but it's a lot of people that hate we villains in a lot of eyes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We're the villain. And you know what? I'm okay with being the villain for, for the other people coming in, younger people or newer people coming in, because I want to build a platform for women. You know, I say women because I am a woman to be safe you know, I want, I don't want people to be afraid. When I first went into the strip club or got into this industry, we have to figure it out. And it sounds like our parents, you know, I figured it out, but now you got to figure it out. No, no. I ran, I bled, I went through the mud for you to be able to at least go through through this smoother than I can. Do not be afraid Mm -hmm. to come to me if you need help or experienced anything like I've experienced. I'm here to guide you. Yeah. Well, and that's the, that's the power, right? Is women supporting women. So yeah, it's a wonderful thing to see. Well, London, thank you so much for joining us. This has been really eye opening and, and so interesting. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. Um, can you tell everybody where they can find you online, plug your socials, your main website, wherever you would like to direct people to learn more about what you do? Yes, you could visit my website at londonbridges.co. I'm going to say that again, (laughs) londonbridges.co. You can find me on all social platforms, London Level Up. And definitely, you know, when checking me out, check out my burlesque entertainment. I'm definitely taking it to the next level along with my music. Definitely check out my hose project, my House of Sirens project. I do have a single out. And if you buy the single, all the proceeds go to my project, helping guide women and helping shelter them if they need any sex workers in need of any type of guidance. And check out my afternoon tea parties. I love that. I love Who doesn't love a good tea party? I love a good tea party. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> and you guys can, of course, find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. I'm also on TikTok, Holly Randall Unfiltered. And of course, as always, if you'd like to support this podcast and get access to bonus content and early releases of the episodes, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for joining us this week, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>